This is Don Frederico, host of Higher Callings. As we prepare the podcast for season two, we wanted to provide listeners with highlights from our first season that are meant both to inspire and inform. Like me, all of our season one guests were lawyers, but their practices and experiences couldn't have been more different. Our first guest was David Hoffman, a highly respected mediator and founder of the Boston Law Collaborative, who teaches mediation at Harvard Law School. David brings an approach to mediation that emphasizes the humanity of the parties before him and sets him apart from many other mediators I've encountered. Our second guest was Phil Mueller, a trial lawyer who left a promising career in a major Boston law firm to prosecute felonies in the state district attorney's office, where he tried more than two dozen homicide cases. Next, we interviewed Jennifer Haverkamp, a Rhodes Scholar and graduate of Yale Law School who led two international climate negotiations in the final year of the Obama administration. And we closed out season one with an interview of Emily Cook, a partner at the Pierce Atwood Law Firm who oversees the firm's pro bono program. In the first clip of this highlights episode, David Hoffman describes an approach called the internal family systems model that he applies to mediation but that also can help the rest of us gain a better understanding of how to navigate conflict in our own lives. Enjoy. Then I I learned about this other way of looking at things. Uh, The internal family systems model posits that we are all quite similar, actually, in having multiple parts. We have a part of us that likes to work hard. We have a part that likes to play. We have a part that is loving. We have a part that's fearful. We have um, uh, optimistic parts, pessimistic parts, um, and the internal system of how those parts interact with each other has a big influence on how we make our way in the world. And when we see people in conflict, it's often because they have some wounded part, uh, they got re-injured, and their angry protector parts are out there throwing accusations uh, to defend that, that wounded part. Uh, it happens to all of us. And learning that model has helped me be uh, more compassionate for the people that I work with because I, I can see in them the same patterns, dynamics that I see in myself. And also uh, gives me some tools for how to encourage them to get those angry gladiator parts to just take a step back, make room for some problem solving parts. And also the model posits that we all have self energy, which the faith traditions would call spirit or soul or heart. Uh, that self is like our internal mediator. And so this model has helped me see that I can actually have heart to heart connections with people um, that are within my job description. It's not like I'm taking on the role of psychotherapist, I'm not. But I can try to get my angry or defensive parts or worried parts to take a step back just be authentically present for people. And when we do that, it opens, it can open up space for them. I mean, we can encourage them to get their parts, take a step back. And having that heart to heart connection with people often can pave the way for not only a resolution, but a resolution that they feel peaceful about. Our next guest was Phil Mueller. Contrary to the perception that some people hold that prosecutors only care about winning convictions, Phil has always believed and taught other prosecutors that persons accused of crimes are among the members of the public whose rights and safety prosecutors and police officers are charged to protect. We spoke about that responsibility and other ethical responsibilities of prosecutors at some length in the podcast. But first, Phil talked about the prosecutor's responsibility to the victims of violent crimes and to the families of murder victims, as presented in the next clip. What, what was it, Phil, about the types of cases you were trying that especially mattered to you? I 
think I grew up with a very strong sense of personal responsibility and accountability. Um, you know, I, and, and that's, that's my family, you know, that was, that's where I got that. Uh, and, and so that mattered to me. And, um, from the standpoint of the victims, you know, or in the case of the homicides, the, the victim's family. As a prosecutor, um, you're their one chance to get justice. Um, you can't fix what happened to them, uh, but you can help them get on with their lives because you can you can help them not be stuck in the uh, the terrible injustice of what had happened to them. You know, people talk about closure, and it that is to some extent a myth. Uh, it's certainly overblown. People never get over losing a loved one to a violent crime, but they can learn. They can have their faith in the world restored. If they feel like someone listened to them and someone went, went to bat for them and not just the prosecutor, but the police and the jurors eventually too. Um, so that mattered to me. Yeah. And, and, you know, every time I, it's, it's a horrible thing. <laughs> It's a horrible thing putting someone in prison or being instrumental in them going to prison for a serious crime. But at that point, the crime has been committed. Uh, you can't fix that. And the best that you can do is hold people accountable and protect the community from the next thing that that person's going to do or would do if you let them walk away. Uh, so I know in this I know there are people alive today because of the work that I did, not just me, that every ADA did and that police officers do. Um, there's, you know, the police officers maybe more directly, but you're saving lives. Right. Right. Especially when you're trying homicide cases. Yeah, you've I mean, got the right person sitting in the defendant's chair. People don't generally, uh, homicides generally aren't a person's starter crime. Um, right. You know, they, they don't, it, there's no fast rules or hard and fast rules, but they, they generally graduate to them from other things. And you realize that had they been stopped earlier, you know, uh, someone else would be alive today. And, and if they get away with it, they're emboldened to do more. Next, I spoke with Jennifer Haverkamp, about her important work in the Obama State Department in 2016, leading two sets of international climate negotiations. But there were two other negotiations that were also uh, on track, if possible, to be completed in 2016. And so I led those two negotiating teams. What were those uh, agreements? So one is uh, ended up being called the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol is the international environmental agreement dedicated to protecting, to eliminating the hole in the ozone layer um, by international agreement to phase out the use of the chemicals that cause the hole in the ozone layer. And um, there's a chemical called hydrofluorocarbons, a class of chemicals called hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs, which are not a very, not very ozone depleting. So they're a good substitute for the other ozone depleting chemicals. And they used in air conditioning, is that, or refrigeration? Yeah, they're used in air conditioning and refrigeration in particular. They have some other purposes too, like 
making foam and metered dose inhalers for asthma sufferers. Um, but they turn out to be an incredibly potent greenhouse gas. And so extremely important to agree to a phase down of use of HFCs, because if you didn't, the world was getting warmer, the world was rightly getting richer. And so there was more and more need for air conditioning, more and more need for refrigeration of processed food. Um, and if we didn't switch to substitutes to HFCs, um, it was really going to exacerbate climate change. And so, so, H H so do I understand this right? HFCs came in to help as a substitute for what had been used because it was better for the ozone layer. Exactly. But now that people were starting to focus on climate change, they realized that HFCs were much worse for climate change. Exactly. And so you were working on the uh, negotiations to try to phase those substances out in order right. to reduce the impact on climate. Right. And not to not to go on a big detour, but it made for a very complicated negotiation because the Montreal Protocol was not a climate forum. It was not a climate agreement. It was an ozone agreement. It was an ozone agreement. And so there was a big culture shift and, and also the pressure of all the politics of climate coming over into this other forum. But we reached agreement to phase down HFCs significantly. Um, analysts uh, have calculated that the agreement as implemented will avoid up to half a degree of global warming this century. Celsius, so, right? Yeah. For so, those who are really keeping track of what's exactly, Celsius and exactly. what's Fahrenheit, yeah. just in case somebody yeah. is doing yeah. those calculations. So just right there, I mean, an incredible professional rush to be able to say, I played a little part in helping to avoid half a degree of global warming. That's wonderful. And it sounds like it was more than a little part. You were leading a negotiation team. Mm -hmm. The final episode of season one featured my interview of Emily Cook, a corporate lawyer at the law firm of Pierce Atwood, who manages the firm's pro bono program through which the firm's lawyers provide free legal services to individuals and organizations that can't afford to pay for them. We covered a lot of ground in the interview, including this illuminating portion of Emily's answer to my question of why lawyers do pro bono work. But I also think there's another really important rationale for doing pro bono, and I think motivator for for many attorneys. Um, and that that's my seatbelt analogy, which you can evaluate if it's a good one or not. You know, in the last year when we've been talking at Pierce Atwood about um, rolling out a racial justice initiative in response to the, we'll talk later, but in response to the protests of last summer and George Floyd's murder, um, I've used the analogy that, you know, when you're sitting on an airplane as a lawyer and they get on the PA and call for a doctor or nurse, you stay in your seat. You might love to help with whatever crisis is happening, but unless you happen to be a JDMD, you sit in your seat and you wait for the expert to raise their hand and take care of it. When we find ourselves as lawyers confronting social inequity or inequitable access to justice that we actually have the skills to fix. <laughs> That's like they called for a lawyer on the PA system. <laughs> That's when you get out of your seat. You, you take your seatbelt off. Right. I mean, a lot of us, last summer is a good crystallizing example, but if you're paying any attention, most of the time, you're probably feeling frustrated when you read the news that there are lots of problems in the world that you can't help solve. But the problems of inequitable access to justice and folks who are disempowered getting oppressed within a system that doesn't afford them protection or rights, you as a lawyer actually can take your seatbelt off. You actually have skills that can make a difference in that setting. To me, that's a very exciting motivator. And I think it is for many lawyers. Yeah. I, you know, I think that doing pro bono work, or at least doing the right pro bono work, 
can make you feel a lot better about yourself as a lawyer and as a member of society. I, I had a large pro bono case years ago before I joined Pierce Atwood that went on for several years, and we ended up with a great result. I'm now pretty late in my career. I've been doing this for a long time, litigation. But um, when I think back to what are the highlights of my career, that's the first highlight. It's that one case. And it was something that my law firm that I was with at the time allowed me to do for free. Um, and it actually encouraged me and, and took pride in, in what I and the rest of the team that were working on the case did. Um, so there is a real strong sense of fulfillment, personal satisfaction and fulfillment that can yes. come from doing, you know, a good pro bono case or something where you feel like you're really making a difference in somebody's life, even if the firm isn't billing that client and making money off of that. And and the law firms that support that, like Pierce Atwood, you know, deserve a lot of credit for, for doing that. So those are some highlights from season one. The complete episodes can be found at Higher Callings on a number of podcast platforms. We've already begun working on season two of the podcast and plan to begin dropping new episodes in the coming weeks. If you'd like to hear more stories from inspiring people who go the extra mile to make the world a better place, please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. And please consider leaving us comments about this highlights episode or any of the other episodes you listen to. And remember, no matter what struggles or challenges we face in this life, if we seek it out, each of us can find our higher calling.